CataractCoach.com. Challenging cataract cases. Lessons from CataractCoach.com. This is my Hyderabad Ophthalmology Association Vista 2021 oration in honor of Professor Dr. Narendra Swaroop, given today, December 5, 2021. So Professor Dr. Narendra Swaroop was a very incredible person. He was an outstanding ophthalmic surgeon, especially with squint and oculoplastics, beloved professor to generations, treated tens of thousands of patients, prolific author of scientific papers, founder of the Hyderabad Lions Club and local eye hospitals, and a dear friend and colleague to many. And I want to take a moment to honor him before we begin our lecture. Now, here we're going to start off with a routine case. Now, I've sped the video up to two times normal speed, so you can get an idea what a routine case is for me. So we made a paracentesis, putting some anesthetic in the eye. That's just dilute um, 0.5% lidocaine mixed with bound salt solution. There's our dispersive viscoelastic. Here comes the keratome. Notice how it's a very nice single plane incision. Good architecture. I like to nick those limbal vessels. We're making our rexes here. You can see our forceps are marked off at two and a half and five millimeters from the tip. And that, so we can make a nice five millimeter rex. So we just measured there at the end. Some hydrodissection. And then my preferred technique for most of these lenses is some variation of phaco chop, depending on the case. Now, again, this video is sped up. It's about twice normal speed. I don't want to show you speed. That's not the goal. I want to show you what's a routine case for me. You can chop the nucleus in the capsule bag, splitting it in half. We can then bring up each half and emulsify it. And this is a case of relatively modest nuclear density. So certainly we have patients who have a lot higher density than this dense brunescent cataracts, white cataracts. We'll get to all that today, don't worry. So a little hydration of that incision while my technician's switching over to the IA probe. And I wanna do a nice thorough job of removing all the cortex. So again, a pretty much a routine case, but it's important that we set the stage first and show you what a routine case is before we start to show you some of the challenges. That's why we sped this video up. It's only about two minutes here for this routine case. Again, that's sped up, it's not real time. Here comes a single piece of acrylic lens going in the capsule bag, and that looks really nice, nicely oriented. Notice the small details. Look at the draping. All the lash are out of the way. The lid margin is sequestered away. Completely clean. No contamination of the ocular surface. Now the viscoelastic side of the eyelid seal up the incision, and before you know it, we're done with the case. So now let me show you something different. Now this is me operating another case. Look at the white spot of the lens in the top corner of your screen there. It doesn't mean much to me. I'm doing our capsorexis here. Patient says she's never had any prior eye surgery, no trauma. Looks pretty routine. So a little bit of hydrodissection here, a little hydrodissection there. And again, just keep in mind that white spot there. Did you notice anything that happened? Not really. Okay. We'll rotate the nucleus. Let's do some phaco chop. So taking the FACO probe and we get our chopper. And let me see if any of you predicted this because I did not predict it. Get the probe in the eye, here comes our chopper. Let's chop this nucleus in half. And again, watch carefully. And there's the chop and, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, what? Hey, whoa, that nucleus has just fallen into the vitreous. Surprise. Well, that white spot I told you about, the patient had a prior intervitreal injection and unfortunately, that injection nailed or hit the posterior capsule. So her capsule bag was already damaged. And when we did hydrodissection, that just split the posterior capsule wide open. And we didn't even know. She forgot to even tell us that she had a, a prior intravitreal injection. So we're doing a good bimanual anterior vitrectomy and bimanual now cortical cleanup. And that looks pretty clean. Now you can see the big rip in the posterior capsule there. Now it's time for our three-piece lens we're going to place in the sulcus. So here comes our three-piece lens. Luckily, the capsorex is completely intact, so we'll deliver that leading haptic. And then here comes the optic, and we're going to deliver the trailing haptic as well. Now, I wanted to show you this case at the beginning, so you know that even after 20,000 cataract surgeries, even your professor here, the cataract coach, this big UCLA American professor, yes, the nucleus dropped. And what did we do? We stayed calm. Don't fish for it in the vitreous cavity. You and I both know this patient needs a proper pars planar vitrectomy and pars planar lensectomy. And now at the end of the case here, suture the incision shut and make sure there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. 
and the patient went on to see my retina colleague, had a vitrectomy done, and a beautiful outcome. So complications can happen. IOL exchange using the twist and out technique through a standard phaco incision with no special instruments. So the IOL is in the anterior chamber. One haptic is brought out through the unenlarged phaco incision. The edge of the optic is held with straight tying forceps. We'll use the chopper in the other hand to really get a good grip on that optic. There we go. Now using a spatula, the spatula is going to help protect the corneal endothelium and allow us to roll this IOL. So it'll assist in rolling the lens. We roll that optic around the forceps and then pull it outside the eye. Just that easy. And this even works down to a 2.4 millimeter incision with all single piece acrylic lenses and even three piece. Now we've published this technique in the JCRS. The key is the hand positioning, starting supinated, then pronate and keep rotating. Here's a resident performing the technique. We've sped the video up to two times normal, but this is a senior resident who's operating doing the same technique. Again, holding the optic, spatula now is going on top of the IOL optic, protecting the cornea and helping to roll the lens. Now let's show you the external view. External views, the same thing here, rotating, rotating, rotating to curl it up, and it can be brought outside the eye. Give it a try. Thank you. CataractCoach.com, upside down IOL with a bent haptic. Here's how to fix the haptic, flip the lens, and rescue this case. Patients already had the cataract removed. There's the empty capsular bag, beautiful capsular rexus. Capsular bag is filled with our cohesive viscoelastic now. Technician has loaded the lens, and let's see what happens here. So there we go, three-piece lens, the injector being placed inside the eye, the tip. There's the cartridge going in and starting to deliver it. Now remember, the first haptic better come out look like a number seven, but whoa, 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 what is going on here? That haptic is completely bent, and it's in the wrong direction. Look at that. That's the letter S. You need to flip this right away before the lens fully unfolds. So we're going to flip it over, push the lens also down into the capsular bag, use two instruments here, and then the capsular bag is, is obviously still intact, so we'll flip the lens over, get in the right orientation, two-handed technique there. There it is. Now it's in the correct orientation at least, right? The first haptic looks like the letter uh, number seven, the trailing haptic like a capital L. The whole lens is the anti-S orientation. Great, but what are you going to do with that bent haptic? You can't leave it like this. Here's how to fix it. So first thing, get this dialed out, brought towards you. Bring that bent haptic towards the incision. Put more viscoelastic in the eye if you need to. Here I'm using the infusion from the IA to help deepen up the capsular bag. And I need to get this lens. That haptic has to come out of the capsular bag. So we're going to lift it up and get that haptic out of the bag where our goal is to bring this haptic out through the main incision, and then we can manipulate it. Now you can see with this, uh, this patient, this is a very large myopic eye, special order lens. This is easily saved if we can straighten out that haptic. So there it is, you got the haptic up now out of the bag, and now we need to get that haptic and bring it out of the eye. You gotta bring the haptic out, and so we're gonna grab it with forceps, and once it's outside the eye, we can adjust it more. So I want to just fill this eye up, get that eye filled up as much as I can. I don't want to see that eye collapsing. And again, I'm having the technician open to me more viscoelastic. I really try trying to keep this eye inflated. I don't want this lens to wander around so much. Now look, it's it's still there. There's the haptic. That's what I want to get out of the eye. Because once I bring that haptic out of the eye, here's more viscoelastic coming in. Nope, that's hydrating the incision. So we'll hydrate the incision, make sure it doesn't collapse on us. That's a good move while we're waiting for that additional viscoelastic. So normally in these cases, we only open up enough viscoelastic to complete the case, not enough viscoelastic for special maneuvers. So we've got to wait for it. But remember, viscoelastic is much cheaper than vitreous. So there it goes. More co of cohesive viscoelastic. That's it. Really getting that eye inflated, giving us plenty of working room. And now I need to get that haptic out of the eye. So look how much time this is taking. This is showing you in real time. But we want to be safe here. There's that extra viscoelastic. Now it's easy to grab that haptic. So let's grab the haptic and let's pull it outside the eye. There it is. At this point, now 
I can use two forceps, just two tying forceps, and we can straighten out the kink that's in that haptic, and it'll resume its normal shape, and everything will be fine. So there it is. Now it has its normal shape and orientation. So more viscoelastic going in the eye. Now I'll dial it into the capsular bag. So could you have expanded this lens and put another lens in? Sure you can. You can do anything you want. But this lens right now is as good as new. It'll go back in the capsular bag, and look, it'll be beautifully centered. The rexus will overlap the optic, and we are doing great. So making sure that's right where we want it. That's in the sulcus. Now look, it's going to be dialed in. It's still in the sulcus. This is tricky. There it goes. Let's see, do we get it in the bag yet? And you can see this is a lot of extra work to do here. So you've got to be good with the hands. You've got to be patient. Don't rush things. Look, extra viscoelastic going in still. So I still have that second haptic. It's not in the bag just yet. So we need to dial it in. There it is. That's in the bag now. Now both haptics and the optic are in the capsule bag. There's a beautiful overlap. This is going to be a very nice outcome. Patient did beautifully. No untoward effects. I'm glad we could rescue this case and give the patient a beautiful outcome. So you can see here at the end, taking out all the viscoelastic, and there's a beautiful lens position. It's nicely centered. Both haptics are in good position, and both haptics are in the normal form and not at all distorted. So the lens does stay beautifully centered. Finishing hydration of that incision a little bit more, and then we'll reinflate through the paracentesis and get that lens tucked exactly where we want it. Woo, that's a fun save. If you have this, you'll know how to fix it. CataractCoach.com, IOL exchange with a stuck haptic. Here's how to free the entire IOL without damaging the capsule. So the patient had cataract surgery with a trifocal lens about a month ago, and you can see there's the original incision. I, should, I don't like it because it's avascular. Also, it's on the flat meridian. This patient had a femtosecond laser capsulotomy, but this patient's just not happy having the vision compromise that's inherent in any trifocal eye well. So he's sitting superiorly, because that's his steep axis. And we're going to make a paracentesis opposite. Notice how far away the paracentesis is. Now we're showing you the whole video today at a sped up twice normal speed, and that's so we can get through the whole case. And here we go. Now time for the main incision. I'm going to make my main incision 2.75 millimeters wide on the steep axis. But you can see it's just about 95 degrees. There it is, nice tunnel construction. And yes, I nicked the limbal vessels. That's much better. It'll be much better long-term healing. Now, we're getting a needle, a 27 or 30 gauge needle, and put the viscoelastic, your dispersive viscoelastic on, on it and inject a little bit underneath that rim. There you go. And now we can get that spatula. This is a blunt spatula, cyclodialysis spatula. And I'm pivoting as much as I can, getting 180 degrees of freed up capsule. Now I'll go over the other side and it's still tough to get under there. So we may need to inject more viscoelastic. We're trying, trying to get under there, not quite gonna happen. So try this me method, there we go, there's a gap. And so the key is in the whole case is you have to really separate the anterior capsular leaflet from the posterior capsule where they fuse together. And you can see that whitish haze there on the edge of the capsule, it's already starting to fibrose which is the normal healing response, of course. So now injecting more viscoelastic. Watch behind the optic. That's a viscoelastic wave. That wave of viscoelastic has dissected the optic away from that delicate posterior capsule. And let's see, can we pull out one haptic? Uh, let's not do that. Let's just try to free it up more. So remember, this lens is the Alcon Panoptics, has a bulbous tip on the end of the haptic. So you really have to do a full dissection with that blunt spatula to free it up. And there you can see that haptic is completely freed up. That looks great. You can bring that up out of the capsule bag. But look at the, the other haptic, the one that's inferior on the screen, which is, of course, the patient superior. So let's try dissect a little more in that quadrant. And is that enough? Nope. Look, it's still attached. There's still adhesions to that bulbous tip. So we'll do it again. Being very delicate here. You don't want to damage the capsule. This capsule's wimpy, right? Think about it. Still not enough. So I just want to keep trying and do as little as possible. I don't want to damage the capsule. So I'll do it again, and I think that may have done it. Let's see. I felt like that may have done it. Can we bring that? There it is. 
we freed it up now. So now both haptics are freed up from their capsule attachments. We can bring this lens up into the anterior chamber and we're going to um, explant it. Of course, we're gonna do, let me zoom in here for you, the twist and out technique. So there's the one haptic outside the eye, grabbing the optic, using the spatula to help fold that over, roll it and bring it out of the eye. There it is, there's your entire lens. That looks great, get that off the field. Let's implant our new lens. This patient wants a monofocal lens. This patient desires the best image quality. And I've not seen any kind of light splitting technology, any kind of trifocal, bifocal, you name it lens, that gives the best image quality or better image quality than a monofocal lens. So if you value the highest image quality at the focal point, which is far distance or plane on the side, you definitely want the monofocal. So we'll put that monofocal new lens going right back in the capsule bag. And that's gonna, we're gonna, again, aiming for Plano, let those haptics open up and that lens will center beautifully. Now, time for the eye probe going inside the eye. Be delicate here. The capsule is really wimpy. Remember, any reoperation like this has more complications, higher risks than the original surgery. And oftentimes you have to be, you can be surprised by having weakness in certain tissues. Remember, I didn't do the original cataract surgery. I don't know um, the surgeon or what he did during the surgery. All I see is the results after. And so we want to be super cautious here. And you can see there's a nice overlap of the optic by the rexus. We'll do a little light hydration sealing of that incision. And again, under the, we protected the corneal endothelium, the entire case with that dispersive viscoelastic. And now a little bit more of the hydration. And we'll go in here, make sure there's no retained viscoelastic because the lens is beautifully centered, and we can seal up or hydrate that paracentesis as well. Now let's uh, put some medication in the eye. There's some triamcinolone, helping with some inflammation control, and then we'll also put some preservative-free moxifloxacin as an antibiotic, and that looks great. Beautiful result here. We're not quite done yet. We've got to do a matching limbal relaxing incision. So here it is, opposite the main incision. We just get to correct this patient has about 0.75 diopters of astigmatism with the rule. And the patient had a beautiful surgical procedure. CataractCoach.com challenges with akinesia and anesthesia. So your colleagues refer you a special case. Here's the patient. Now you're saying, that's a lot of movement. Why don't you tape the head? We did tape the head. Still seems like a lot of movement. Why don't you have your assistant hold the patient's head? We're doing that too. Okay, why not have your anesthesiologist give the patient a lot more sedation? I mean, come on, intubate the patient. Paralyze her. No, not this case. This patient has significant systemic medical issues, and her internist and her cardiologist had already said, you have to give a minimum amount of anesthesia. She's not going to be able to tolerate a large degree of anesthesia. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to get into the rhythm of her motions, of her shakes. And we'll kind of keep on a mental track of that rhythm. So we'll start at the rexus here. How do you prevent a run out? Well, any movement, you come out of the eye. So obviously your hands are resting on her face. When you sense a little movement, come out of the eye. And then you'll know you have a few seconds of a window to do more of the surgery. So do more rexus. Now stop. Let's pause here for a second. Uh, yeah, there's another motion. Let her get, get that out of her system. Now we're going to have another 10 seconds of ability to operate. Now, I know you're saying, why even do this case? Why did you accept? I feel sad for the patient. The patient needs this surgery. You can see the marks on the cornea. This patient's going to get a torque lens. Those are the torque alignment marks. Let's get that rexus done. Woo, hard part is done. Nice five millimeter rexus. Now, it's going to be tough during FACO too because normally you think, yes, when I have two instruments in the eye, you fixated the eye, the eye can't move much. But we're not talking about eye movements. It's the patient's whole head, the whole body. And this is with the most sedation we can give the patient and it's with the head taped down, and it's with my um, surgical scrub tech holding the patient's head down. So a little bit of iris prolapse there. Let's push that back in the eye. Now I've tilted the nucleus partially out of the capsule bag. I think it's gonna make life a little easier. A little more viscoelastic to pr protect that cornea. Let's get that phaco probe. Whew, take a deep breath here. Let's do this. Now, obviously we gotta be very careful about the posterior capsule. You break the posterior capsule, you can't put your torque lens in. And remember, this patient is relatively monocular. The other eye had a vascular occlusive event in the retina and doesn't see so well. So we'll try to do a little bit of it here. And when she shakes a whole lot, you just come out of the eye. So, so far we're in a nice little window. I try to be super efficient here, remove this nucleus. It's also why I'm operating outside the capsule bag. Bring that up to the iris plane 
And we don't want to operate within the bag too much. And so just like that, whoo, got that nucleus out. Come out of the eye. Let's give her a little break. Try to get the epinuclear shell. Can we get that while she's still relatively still? Oh, yes. Chop in the safe position. Don't let that capsule come up near the phago probe. And just in the nick of time, there's the next motion. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So the patient obviously has a lot of systemic problems, and we're happy that we could do this surgery for the patient. Now, I'll give you another good pearl here. When the patient says, am I doing okay? Your answer is, yes, you're doing beautifully. You're doing your best. Thank you. Do not yell at the patient. Do not raise your voice. If you do that, it'll make the patient even more nervous, and you'll get even more movement. So you tell the patient, you're doing a beautiful job. We are so appreciative. Everything is going great. And next thing you know, let's get that lens loaded up. Let's do this. And so we can get that lens in the capsule bag. So I'm happy to tell you the case goes well. The patient does fine. But this is one of the big challenges. This is probably one of the toughest cases I've done in my career. Now, the challenge isn't intraocular per se. It's otherwise a normal case. And nucleus is out and the torque lens goes in. But it's just the other issues, the akinesia and anesthesia. Now, we've certainly given enough topical tetracaine and intracameral preserve-free lidocaine to numb the eye. So the patient's comfortable in that regard. But we just can't achieve akinesia of the head, of the body. And it's one of those tough cases where you would just wish, could you just give her a little bolus of propofol? Even that'll buy me a little time. But unfortunately, due to her severe systemic medical conditions, you really can't do that either. So just doing our best to go in behind the lens, remove viscoelastic. Now keep in mind, what are the high risk parts of the procedure? The very beginning, the rexus is very high risk. So we did that in multiple steps. The incision, the diamond keratomes are incredibly sharp. So really time that incision correctly so you're right in shakes. And now here, getting that lens rotated to the proper position, be careful. So I, if I think she's gonna shake, I wanna come out of the eye. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna have that chopper touch or break the posterior capsule because then I have a, sul- a lens that can't go in the sulcus. So again, let me just come out of the eye, let her get her move on. We'll go back in, get this thing reoriented little by little. I think I have a couple seconds left. I can wait, come out of the eye. Let me wait until she kind of gets through this shake and seal up the incision. We'll see where our final lens position is. We can even do some positioning of the lens using the bounce salt solution cannula through the side port. And again, this is trying to hold her head down. This really is trying our best. And you know, this patient is also herself trying to hold still for you. But with the severe Parkinson's and other medical conditions, you really can't do any better than this. This is what you've got. And lucky we were able to just roll with it and get this case done. And you can see there's my other hand. There's my left hand holding the head down too. So I got my scrub tech helping. I'm helping. We're really trying our best to get this patient relatively still. Thank goodness the the main part of the surgery is over. So let's seal up that incision. And then we'll get this patient off the OR table and tell her, congratulations, you did a beautiful job. Oh, let's put some triamcillin inside that eye. So in case you can't get the drops in the post-op period, because... The post-op drop regimen, well, that's a whole nother story. Thanks for watching. CataractCoach.com, managing capsular issues so you can still implant your premium lens. So starting off with a rexus here, oh my goodness, woo, what happened? So what we want to do instead is you want to buzz in here with the FACO probe and create a nice opening here. This is an intumescent white cataract, and we want to still be able to put in our premium lens in the bag. So we'll do the double rexus technique to avoid that Argentinian flag sign. And now here at the end, with a new lens in the bag, now we can go ahead and go around and, and enlarge that rexus. So we've enlarged it there. We can nick the other side and complete it as well. So watch this now. Here's a different case. Cleaning up, doing some cortex removal, and look, boom, right there. He just broke a hole in the posterior capsule. How did that happen? Well, listen, patients can have weak tissues. There can be some weak protoplasm, weak posterior capsules. So we're going to try to create a posterior rexus out of that hole. And you may or may not succeed. I'm trying my best because a posterior rexus, even if it's small or eccentric, is okay because that'll prevent the capsule from ripping out further. But I'm just kind of unable to do it despite my best efforts. That break is such that it doesn't really want to allow me to. So let's try and make another opening here. Gonna make another paracentesis, get that last bit of cortex. I don't wanna leave that in the eye. Now let's put our lens in. This is a toric trifocal lens. It's going in the capsule bag despite that break there. 
Now you can see the poster capsule did open up a little bit, but there's still sufficient support here. We can dial the lens into the correct orientation. Now in this case, I do not recommend going behind the lens to remove the viscoelastic. Think about it. So now the lens is in good position. Let's first seal up the incision because I don't want to cause any instability in the anterior chamber. I don't want the AC to collapse and then vitreous to come through that break. Right now, the anterior hyaloid face is intact. There's zero vitreous prolapse. Please, let's keep it that way. The toric lens is, the toric marks are nicely lined up on the appropriate axis, and the center of the uh, light reflex, the center of the pupil, is beautifully aligned up with the trifocal diffractive rings. So let's remove the viscoelastic as, as much as we can. We're lowering our settings here too. So on the flow on the machine, let's cut it by half. So maybe only 30 cc's a minute and lower the, the vacuum too. And now we, you see we didn't let the AC collapse. The lens is in good orientation. There's the break in the posterior capsule. And I can tell you this patient had a nice outcome. Now I'm going in there with balanced salt solution just to kind of squirt BSS into the angle to wash out any retained viscoelastic because I know I can't do a really aggressive viscoelastic removal with the IA probe for fear of having vitreous prolapse. So in this case, we're still able to implant a toric trifocal lens in the capsule bag, despite having a posterior capsule rupture. So fortunately, again, no vitreous prolapse. There's the end of the case. Let's show you another one. You know we should never put a single piece of acrylic lens in the sulcus. You can see that transillumination defect and the problems. So let's look at this case. Patient having a nice rexus done. That looks pretty good. Everything looks fine here. Let's do the surgery. And as I'm doing the cortex removal, I notice, oh, look at the right side of your screen there. The patient's 6 o'clock. That anterior capsular rim has radialized it. Maybe the phaco probe hit it or the chopper, some other instrument. But there's a big radialization there. So fill the capsular bag with viscoelastic. Do not let the AC collapse. Because you don't want that one area to zip around to the back and hit the posterior capsule. So now, guess what? We're putting in a toric trifocal again. But you have that weakness in the anterior capsular rim. So don't overfill the eye viscoelastic because I don't want to have any pressure causing that radialized area to zip around to the back. So gently, gently, gently putting the toric lens in the eye. Again, toric trifocal. It's going to go in very easily here. And now we're going to get it centered up the way we want it and get those rings appropriately placed. There it is, nicely, nicely opening up. Now you see we placed the haptics a little bit before the spot where I want them. I just want to take our time opening that lens up. You don't want to manipulate the lens too much in the capsule bag. Again, I don't want to place any stress that's going to cause that anterior capsular run out to go zip around to the back. So now I've got the lens pretty much where I want it. It's lined up on the toric axis. The trifocal rings are pretty well centered. So now the key is how do you remove viscoelastic and still keep everything stable? The key is to get out of Dodge, right? So we've got the eye pro. We want to remove viscoelastic. But before we do that, let's hydrate the main incision again. So again, we've seen this now in a couple of cases. I don't want that incision to leak. So when I take the eye probe out of the eye, I do not want the AC to collapse. So eye probe going in the eye gently. We reduced our settings. So we cut our flow by half. So from 60 cc's a minute to 30 you can also decrease the infusion pressure. You can also decrease the vacuum level. And just take your time here. Now you're wondering, there's a little bit of stuff there. Should I polish the capsule? Come on now. Let's be serious here. Don't touch anything. I'll just barely nudge the lens over a little bit more, trying to be as gentle as I can to get this lined up. Now you can see there's that radialized area to the right side of the IA probe. And now it's pretty good. I've pretty much removed the viscoelastic. Don't let the AC collapse. So watch, in the left hand, BSS on the cannula, and do not let the AC collapse. Now take the eye probe out, inject, 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 and good, keep that AC form. Do not let that eye collapse. Because any of those changes in the, the anterior chamber pressure or depth and all that, and lens motion, all those things can cause that radialized area to zip back. So now we're pretty good, again, washing out the angle with balanced salt solution just to get some of that extra retained viscoelastic out to prevent a pressure spike on day one. And it looks pretty darn good. And now we have the optic overlap for probably about 270 degrees, maybe even more. 
300 degrees. And so that's going to be so plenty sufficient. This lens is going to stay in perfect position. I can tell you the patient had a normal post-op outcome, is thrilled, had a beautiful result. She can't tell the difference between this eye and the other eye. And so there is a way of just, you know, getting out of Dodge here when you have the complications and still being able to put in your lens appropriately. So whether you have an anterior capsular issue, a posterior capsular issue, there are cases where you can still put in your single piece acrylic premium lens in the capsule bag and still finish the case and have a beautiful outcome. Thank you for watching. CataractCoach.com. My biometers show differing astigmatism. What to do when each machine gives a different measurement? So first thing is Pearl 1, look at the ocular surface. So you see that precise topography that's a really nice looking butterfly or figure of eight ring there of astigmatism. And now look in that bottom right corner, you can see the very clean reflection of those rings from the corneal surface. This is a nice, clean corneal surface. But now, if you look at this other eye, look how irregular it is. You can't make anything of the topography because look at the bottom right corner. What irregular reflection of those rings. This patient has severe ocular surface issues that must be addressed before you do the cataract surgery. Don't even plan it yet. Now, much better, that same eye, look, after treating the dry eye syndrome, it looks a whole lot better. Now you can actually make out where is the astigmatism. So at this point, the reflection of the rings looks much nicer, and at this point, we can actually probably proceed with the cataract surgery. So this patient now is ready for surgery. It's not always possible to fix the cornea, so you need to set appropriate patient expectations much lower. And avoid treating the astigmatism. If it's so irregular you can't make anything out of it, don't do a toric lens or an LRI. So the patient's right eye looks pretty normal. The patient's left eye has a chronic Bell's palsy and an irregular cornea. Pearl 2 is beware of contact lens use. This patient looks pretty regular, 1.75 diopters of astigmatism, and those RGP contacts were out for 15 minutes. But look at the topography, it looks clean. Look at the reflection of the rings, it looks pretty good. It's a really clean axis. This should be easy, right? So, okay, let's do the calculations. So based on the initial biometry, we do the calculations and it says, okay, we'll do a T4 toric lens. That's gonna correct about a one and a half diopters or so of astigmatism. We do these calculations and we're ready to book the surgery. And then you say, you know, let's retry this. Let's keep the contact lens out for a month or so. Now. Same patient. Now the patient has 2.75 doctors of astigmatism with the RGP contacts out for a month. Wow, what a difference. You uncovered an entire extra diopter of astigmatism to treat. That's a huge difference. That's a lot more astigmatism. And so now we do the calculations. Now look, we're using a T6 toric lens. So that lens is going to correct about 2.5 diopters of astigmatism at the corneal plane. And I can tell you, the post-op result of this patient was spot on. This patient was thrilled and absolutely had a perfect outcome there. And thank goodness we took the contacts out. Pearl 3, it's easier with higher astigmatism. Look at that arrow. That's an eye with zero sill, a cornea with no sill. If you rotate it, nothing really happens, right? Because it's perfectly spherical. So if you look at the next one, that's a half diopter of astigmatism. And as we rotate it, you can tell it's bare. There is some sill that's a little bit out of round, right? And if you go to one diopter, now it's even more obvious to see. You know, now you know where the skirt circle has been squeezed. And one and a half diopters, look at that. It's so obvious now. So same with our topographers. If it's a high degree of astigmatism, it is so easy for the topographers and biometers to come up with an exact axis. This is the exact axis. But if it's a low amount of astigmatism, you kind of only know where's the astigmatism? What's the correct axis? So fortunately, for higher degrees of astigmatism, it's easier. Now, Pearl 3, it is easier, like I said, with higher astigmatism, but certain eyes, even RK eyes, more than one diopter can still be consistent across the biometers. So let's RK cuts, four cut in one eye, six in the other, and look at the biometers. That's showing both the topography and the tomography of each eye, and they're dang near identical. So higher degree of the cell is easier. And here's that same patient who had the RK cuts. Look at the post-op results. That's the actual autorefractor printout. That's pretty darn close. And of course, it's an RK patient, so it's perfect now, but in five or 10 years, they'll be back to a little bit of hyperopia. And you can see those toric lenses were certainly the right choice for this patient. 
Lower astigmatism varies more. So similar axis, but different magnitude of astigmatism. So here, one machine topographer says half diopter 167. The tomographer says 0.78. The keratometer on the lens star says 0.95. Well, luckily you have all the same axis. So you can treat it, but go somewhere in the middle. So Pro 4 is, when in doubt, undercorrect. You can always do another LRI post-op or even do LASIK or PRK. But don't overcorrect them. And sometimes people like keeping their sill. Here's another good trick you can do. Here's one fake incision being made on the steep axis. In this case, that's probably about the 60 degree mark. And at the end of the case, the eye was in the bag. Let's make another axis incision there on that same axis. And this can treat about 0.5 to, to 1 diopter of astigmatism, depending on how you're doing it, the incision width, and your nomogram. So using paired incisions is a very useful technique as well. And then finally, here at the end, here's an LRI. This can be done certainly at the time of the cataract surgery on the OR table, but you can even do an LRI in the post-op period, in your clinic. Or they can do it even at the slit lab. There are companies that sell specialized LRI blades that are very short, that have plenty of space to work at the slit lab. So in summary, my four pearls are, number one, look at the ocular surface. Number two, beware of contact lenses, especially RGPs. Number three, it's always easier with higher astigmatism. And number four, the most important, when in doubt, okay to undercorrect. Thank you for watching. CataractCoach.com, compilation video, the Sulcus IOL. We all end up using Sulcus IOLs for tough cases, so come on, learn my tricks here. So here's a case open posterior capsule. Notice how we inject the viscoelastic while we remove the IA probe. Do not let the AC collapse. Do not let vitreous prolapse. And your hyaluronic face is intact. Here comes a sulcus lens. So a sulcus lens, in the U.S. for sure, is a three-piece lens. We don't have any sulcus-designed IOL, so we use a three-piece lens. So here comes the leading haptic. Notice it goes out in the correct orientation. In this case, let's deliver the entire IOL on top of the iris first. Now look at a haptic orientation. It should look like an anti-S, correct? So that leading haptic looks pretty good. That trailing haptic needs to be flipped over a little bit. And now, there you go. Once the lens is there on top of the iris, now we can carefully dial it into position. So the sulcus is the gap between the back of the iris, the posterior surface of the iris, and the anterior capsular rim. So if we place the lens there, remember, it's going to sit a little bit more anterior to its normal position that's in the bag. So here you go, you got the whole lens now is sitting more anterior. So we should adjust its lens power. Now I can do a trick like this, which is dial it into the bag, and then maybe I can opt to capture it. We'll talk about that as well. That'll change its power too. So the first thing we gotta understand is how do you calculate sulcus lens power? That's the rule of nines. Yes, the rule of nines is an easy way of remembering this. Look at the picture here. If the IOL power is zero to nine, there is no change in the lens power from going from bag to sulcus. Nine to 18, subtract a half diopter. 18 to 27, subtract one diopter. That rare case that's above 27 diopters, subtract one and a half diopters from the IOL power. Now that's considering you understand the A constants. In other words, if you're calculating out what's my normal in the bag power, let's say it's 20 diopters for an in the bag placement, of a lens with an A constant of 119.2. Well, now, if you switch to a sulcus lens that has an A constant of 118.7, already you have to subtract half diopter. So in that case, the three-piece lens in the bag would be 19.5, but in the sulcus would be 19.0. Now, here's a lens that's been delivered. That's a three-piece lens. And look what we're doing here. We're capturing the optic. In other words, the haptics are in the sulcus, but the optic is pushed posteriorly behind the anterior capsular axis. So now technically the IOL haptics, yes, are in the sulcus, but the optic is, quote, in the bag because it's behind the posterior capsular axis, I mean the anterior capsular axis. So because this optic is now more posterior, in fact, the same as in the bag, the IOL power is in the bag as well. So just change for the A constant, but you don't have to use the rule of nines. Now, Sometimes you gotta open your incision. Remember, your sulcus lens may require a bigger incision than your standard single piece acrylic that you went in the bag, right? So here's a bigger incision. 
Now we'll deliver that lens. Again, three-piece lens. It's an acrylic lens. And we can get that in the eye very carefully. And a good easy step if you're a beginner is place it on top of the iris to begin with. Because the bubble's out of the eye. And now with the lens on top of the iris, now you can carefully dial it in the sulcus. So make sure those haptics don't go too far posterior. You want them in the sulcus. You want them between the anterior capsule rim and the back surface of the iris. Now don't get optic capture. If you're not going to push the optic behind the rexus, make sure you bring the pupil down with some constricting uh, medications. Let's look at another case here. Here's a case, look carefully. Whoa, Zyler dehiscence a lot. Now the capsule is intact, the posterior capsule, but there's a lot of Zyler dehiscence for this traumatic cataract. So what should we do here? Well, first thing is, let's place a CTR on the eye, a capsular tension ring. Take your time here. This is a resident operating. If a resident can do this, you can do it too. It's not that hard. But let's get that CTR in the capsule bag. That'll help give us a lot more support. Now, what are the options here? You could put a single piece of acrylic lens in the bag. You could have put a three piece in the bag. But you know what's even more support and more long-term stability is this. Watch carefully. Three-piece IOL. Got to go in the eye. Look at the haptics. The anti-S orientation is correct. And let's keep the haptics in the sulcus. We're going to push the optic behind the rexus. So like a button through a buttonhole on your dress shirt, we're going to capture this optic into position, and that's going to give an incredible degree of stability. Just think about it. The CTR is inside an intact capsule bag, helping to push outwards on that area of zinal loss or weakness. This IOL is going to be a three-piece with the haptics and the sulcus, and the optic captured behind that intact, beautiful 5 millimeter rexus. And again, this is a resident case. This surgeon has done maybe 100 cataracts. You can do this, I assure you. Hold yourself to a higher standard. Remember, a cataract coach taught you. You compete with yourself, not with anyone else. Now here you go, tucking that optic under that rexus. Now you know why it's so important to make that good rexus at the beginning of the case. This is incredible long-term stability. This IOL will be good for the rest of the patient's life. Let's move on. Next case. Here we go. We got another resident who's operating. Three-piece lens going in. Let's watch carefully. There's the leading haptic coming out correctly. Remember the orientation, the anti-S. So that first haptic looks like the number seven. And the trailing haptic better look like the capital letter L. That's the seven L rule. By the way, all these original videos are on cataractcoach.com. I know you like the compilation video. I know you like to watch it on YouTube, but you'll actually get a lot more out of it if you watch it on cataractcoach.com. But hey, whatever makes you happy. So there's the lens. We're going to get it in. There's that trailing haptic, correct orientation. Get it gently dialed on the sulcus. Now, sometimes it's helpful to put a little bit of viscoelastic, put a little dollop of cohesive viscoelastic to help open up that sulcus. And be very cautious here, dialing this around. This resin's doing a good job. That lens looks pretty good. So remember, if the lens optic stays in the sulcus, use the sulcus power. That's the rule of nines after you change the A content. If, however, you're going to do this reverse or these optic capture, so haptics in the sulcus, optic behind the rexus, then you're going to use the in the bag power. All you got to do is change for the A constant. Now, watch this here. Lens going in the capsule bag? No, 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 no. Lens going in the sulcus. So let's put that haptic on top of the iris again, dialing it into position. And we're going to show you what we're going to do now. Optic capture, maybe. A little more viscoelastic going in. Dialing that lens around. Now be careful. When you have a case like this, you may already have an open posterior capsule. You may have a tendency for vitreous to prolapse. You've got to be super careful about that. And you dial that lens in. Now, do you need a peripheral iridotomy? You know, the classic teaching is you do not need a peripheral iridotomy in a patient with a sulcus IOL. Now, can you put one in? Hey, whatever makes you happy. Sure, why not? I don't think it'll hurt to put one in, especially if it's nice and small. But the classic te teaching is that you do not need it. But what do you need? You got a case like this with an open posterior capsule? Do yourself a favor. Put in the 10 nylon. Close the incision the problem is if you get this incision to gape or, or open up or you lose the IOP or the AC shells in the post-op period, you know what happens? The, vis the vitreous comes around the edge of the IOL. 
The eye wall comes out of the sulcus. You see the page the next morning with optic capture. Now, what's this picture show you? This is a bad mistake. That's a single piece acrylic lens in the sulcus. Please, I beg you, do not ever put a single piece of acrylic lens in the sulcus. It's not meant to go there. Translumination defect, UGH syndrome, sun setting lens. In fact, if you put a single piece of acrylic lens in the sulcus, I'm gonna unsubscribe you from cataractcoach.com videos. Now, here's the last important pearl. Look at that lens coming out, it looks great, right? 7L rule, first haptic looks like the number seven, that looks good. Let's dial that into position, nice and easy. It's going in the bag. Not even a sulcus lens there. But I'm showing you this video for a reason. Watch this now. So same thing, sulcus lens, right? Or three-piece lens. Let's load it up. Grabbing that lens. Coating it in viscoelastic. Nice and gentle here. Using those fancy forceps. Putting it down the plunger here. Down the cartridge. What happens though? Sometimes when you place these lenses. Ooh, ultra high my 1.0 diopters. Sometimes when you place these lenses in the cartridge, they twist on you. Not your fault. That's just the nature of this. But you've got to be aware when it comes out of the cartridge into the eye that you, oh, look at that. You flip that orientation. You saw that haptic the wrong way. Now look, it's not coming out like a number seven. So twist the whole injector, rotate it upside down. Make sure, there it is, the number seven. Leading habit comes out in the correct orientation. Now, twist your hand back over in the other direction and let's get this lens in appropriately. So make sure you never put the lens in the eye upside down. So thanks for watching the Sulcus Eyewell compilation. CataractCoach.com, secrets and subtleties, perfecting your cataract surgery technique. The secrets to avoid corneal edema after cataract surgery. Well, step one is you want a wave of good viscoelastic. Not the stringy stuff, not spaghetti. You want a wave. Watch carefully. You want to use a good high quality dispersive viscoelastic and that wave is going to coat the corneal endothelium. If it comes out like spaghetti string, it's not going to coat. That's very important. Now step two, you got to make a great incision. It allows for appropriate placement of the instruments It'll seal well at the end. This is gonna help avoid corneal edema. Here I'm doing a single plane incision and you wanna have it very repeatable, very clean architecture, very well sealing. So these are two things right off the bat that are important. But wait, there's more. Now we wanna have the surgery itself be relatively quick. Now the goal is not speed, the goal is efficiency. No wasted movements, no wasted steps. And to achieve this, you want to cut out all the extra parts of the surgery that don't benefit the patient. If you can make a beautiful capsular rexus like this with just the forceps, stop using assistatome. You don't need assistatome to do cataract surgery. That's just an additional step. All these additional steps together prolong the case and you get more inflammation. Now, number three, what should we do? Put more viscoelastic to protect the corneal endothelium after you complete hydrodissection. So we're gonna add more protective dispersive OVD right there in the center prior to putting the phaco probe in the eye. Because the hydrodissection causes you to lose viscoelastic. You may not realize it, but it's true. Now we're gonna go inside the eye, chop the nucleus, and we're gonna break it up and here's where it's important to use a very efficient way of nucleofractus. So minimize phaco energy, use phaco chop, stay in the capsule bag, employ phaco power modulations, and easy on the foot pedal. The less ultrasonic energy delivered in the eye, the better it is for the patient. So use a pulse mode. Use a variable duty cycle and be judicious on your delivery of phaco energy. Now, it's not just the ultrasonic energy that causes corneal edema, it's also the amount of fluid you run through the eye. So you wanna minimize that amount of fluid as well. So keep your settings appropriate, don't waste time in the eye. Remember, what's the volume of the anterior chamber? A quarter of a cc? If you add an empty caps or bag and poster chamber, maybe another quarter of a cc, 
That's a half cc. If you're going through more than one bottle of balanced salt solution, well, one bottle is probably 500 cc's. And think about that. 500 cc's means you're turning over this half cc anterior segment a thousand times. So an established and experienced surgeon should be able to do a cataract surgery with very little fluid. 100 cc's or less of fluid is very common for in the hands of an experienced surgeon. And the less fluid you put through the eye, the better. The less ultrasonic energy put inside the eye, the better. If you are going to deliver this energy in the eye, again, stay away from the corneal endothelium. Operate at the iris plane or even deeper in the eye in the capsule bag. But avoid operating near the corneal endothelium. So here we're filling up our capsule bag. You see our capsular rexus there. We're going to load up our lens and deliver the lens. And so this case so far has had a very minimal amount of trauma. You can see the eye looks great. You also notice that we're very careful in pivoting in the incisions. If you distort your incisions and you see wrinkles in your cornea as you're operating, well, you're going to see those same wrinkles the next day on the first post-op visit, and they're going to persist. So to avoid those, you got to pivot in the incisions. Now, our next important point is removing all the viscoelastic from the eye, including from behind the eye well. If you leave viscoelastic in the eye, it can cause blockage of the trabecular meshwork and a very high spike in the intraocular pressure. And if the eye pressure goes very high, 40, 50, 60 cc's, uh, 60 millimeters of mercury or more, this patient's going to have a painful eye and a lot of corneal edema just from that increased intraocular pressure. So make sure you get all the viscoelastic out of the eye from behind the eye well, as well as the angle of the eye. And we've showed you videos in the past about the angle sweep method. Look it up on cataractcoach.com if you're unfamiliar. The angle sweep is a way of making sure there's no retained viscoelastic in the angle of the eye, which is the most common place. That's very important. And then finally, our last important point is use only mild hydration to seal the incision. If you have a good incision with proper architecture, it should seal with just a little bit of hydration. Look how I do the roof of the incision back and forth just a little bit. I do not advocate these huge white spots against the lateral walls of the incision. Those induce a lot of temporary astigmatism and should be avoided. These are the subtleties that you may be missing, and that's the difference between good and great. Watch carefully. Now, the first thing is excellent draping and keeping the eye in primary. Eyelashes are out of the way. The lid margin is fully sequestered. The eye is well-centered in our field. Iris is parallel to the floor. Second, the position and direction of the paracentesis to make sure that it's radial, barely nicking the limbal vessels two clock hours away from where we make the main incision. Use the full CC of the anesthetic for consistency. So put what you want in the eye and put the rest on the cornea. You always use one CC that way. Complete anterior chamber fill, good IOP with the OVD. So get a good fill. There's that wave coming across and achieve that excellent IOP, physiologic. Incision architecture. This time, I'm going to end up shifting it to avoid the conjunctiva. Watch carefully. Starting the incision there, it hits the conj a little bit. So I'll shift to the left and continue the incision because I don't want chemosis. Now measure and plan out that 5 millimeter capsule exercise using these forceps. That part you know. Chopper in the safe position to protect the capsule bag. When that last fragment comes out, look how the chopper is protecting the posterior capsule. That's an important maneuver. We can push the cataract piece in front of the tip, but still we have the soft, rounded back end of the chopper towards the posterior capsule to avoid touching the capsule. Next, Deliver the eye well with the eye in primary. Get the injector tip in, start to deliver, and now make sure the eye stays back in primary. Deliver the lens, and that's a beautiful outcome. Now rotate the lens to facilitate removal of viscoelastic. I think you should go behind the eye well to remove viscoelastic. So if we rotate the lens about 90 degrees, 
away from the incision, now we're able to keep the haptic optic junction away and facilitate that. Make sure you remove all viscoelastic from behind the IOL optic. That's important because if it's a torque lens or a multifocal lens with diffractive rings, you need to have it centered up, and these lenses tend to be slightly tacky and will adhere to the posterior capsule and stay in place as long as there's no OVD. Use the vacuum on the IA probe to get all the OVD out of the angle for 360 degrees. So move that probe around the eye and really vacuum out the viscoelastic from the angle. We don't want to leave any behind. Hydrate the midstroma of the incision very gently, right there in the midstroma, not these two white spots on the side that some people do. Center the eye well, and now sweep the angle, injecting BSS to make sure there's no trapped viscoelastic or even trapped nuclear fragments. It's an important step that's often overlooked. Inflate to the ideal IOP and hydrate the paracentesis, and also we'll inject some moxifloxacin. This is an intracameral antibiotic, and that's going to help us prevent endophthalmitis. So there we go, a little antibiotic as well. Finally, tetracaine sponge prior to performing the LRI, just to make sure the eye is nicely anesthetized. Use the fixation ring to guide the LRI creation. That way it's a beautiful arc exactly where you want it. And finally, check that the incisions are sealed and dry. That looks great. So these are many of the subtleties that are often overlooked. Thanks for watching these videos. Be sure to check out the website too, cataractcoach.com. You'll get the full text and the graphics and the photos plus the videos. And if you sign up for a free daily email, we'll send all of that to you in your inbox every day for free. Come on. Cataractcoach.com. Check it out. Again, I want to thank you for the kind invitation to speak here at your society. It has been a true honor and I'm so glad that I could share this moment with you, my colleagues.